What's up everybody, I'm Brad Mines, your host. Welcome to episode 21 of The Having Report. The price of Bitcoin is about 5,900 American dollars. Time stamped that at 8.30 p.m. on March 29th, which leaves us approximately 44 days left until the next Bitcoin halving. If you're into cool technology like Bitcoin, you're probably interested in other technologies of the future. Today, I have the director of technology of Canada's largest DGI store, OmniView Tech. Pedro is a drone and gimbal specialist. Thanks for coming on to the show, Pedro. How are you holding up in the midst of this crisis going on? It's crazy. I honestly thought, never thought something like this would happen or I'd, I'd ever see it, but here we are. It's been a little bit crazy. It's been up and down. The business, a little bit impacted on the consumer end. Uh, not that great, but besides that, I, I came back from a trip recently, about three weeks ago, so I had to quarantine for for two weeks, which wasn't fun. I had to stay away from everyone, so that was pretty brutal. Yeah, that's, um, that's tough. Where did you go? Yeah, I went to Cuba. Oh, Oh, yes yes i think i saw some pictures on instagram look pretty sick yeah uh, yeah yeah so i saw on your website that you guys are shut down you're just doing online sales right now yeah we're only doing it online and then when it comes to the business like b2b side it's by appointment only so it's one person at a time it's a little bit difficult because typically we sometimes have like a few we're like you know few of us in the office are helping a few customers at the same time so it slowed things down tremendously but what yeah. can you do we're just trying to get by it right now until everything restores back to normal but mostly the, the biggest impact is on the consumer end so that's really died down tremendously businesses are still operating they still need equipment so that's still moving forward quite nicely it's just the consumer end of things it's really pretty bad is the consumer end a large percentage of your business yeah it's about 40 percent of our business so it's that 40 percent has now turned into about five percent so it's a it's a drastic change yeah no looking kidding at it from a percentage any of the fe- uh, federal stimulus that m- perhaps could help your your company throughout the until the coronavirus is sustained yeah there's some loans our accountants looking into other things as well like looking into how we can help our employees because we went from having 12 employees down to three now wow. so it's it's a drastic cut in terms of employees as well our hours of operation is reduced you know no one can come in, in person so it, it's all kind of hitting us pretty hard um, i know some of the other industries getting it even uh, worse than we are like as an example the the food industry they're getting hit pretty hard so for us it's not it's not that bad luckily the um, enterprise we call it enterprise which is the business to business end of things right the enterprise side of the business is doing pretty well that one it's kind of it picked up a little bit because now there we have like certain sensors that can look at temperature uh, so they're, they're thermal and infrared sensors so we got a lot of those uh, sold to specific police agencies and medical agencies they're using them for for scale Scanning. And also on the agriculture side, that's kind of picked up right now. This is when agriculture usually picks up. So that's kind of picked us up. It's, you know, helping us, hold, holding us up. But really the consumer end was something that is typically around this time of year. It's supposed to be booming. The weather's getting better. People want to go out and record or people are going on trips. People that are in the film industry, typically about a month from now, they graduate. So they're all looking for equipment. Now that's kind of died down because no one's really going to school right now. Those guys are up in the air as well in terms of when they're going to finish their schooling and whatnot. So uh, right, you know, right. all of it is impacting us a little bit. Yeah. You said something about using um, like heat sensor technology. Are, are there what specific purposes do they do they publicly say that they're using those for? Yeah, uh, publicly they haven't said anything, but one thing that they've done is that they're, they're utilizing Utilizing it because right now we, we sell within Canada, we sell within US, but we also sell within Europe. So we have a lot of European agencies and Canadian agencies that are buying them and they're using it to uh, look at people's thermal body reading. So there is a specific technology called isotherm where you can hone in uh, what temperatures you're looking at. So we know the human body temperature is uh, 37 degrees. So we're looking for anything above 37 degrees. And the device is not perfect, but it gives you a reading of plus minus 0.5 degrees. So uh, someone that is at 38 degrees as an example and has a fever you can look at that a lot of people are getting this virus and they don't know that they have it themselves and they're, they're feeling a little bit weird their body temperature is a little bit higher but they're not thinking much of it most people uh, especially at the beginning stages were not thinking that they could contract anything you know it's like i haven't done much I'm, i don't i barely go anywhere but going to like something as simple as a drive through and the person that's infected on the other side and you grab it from them and, and that can infect you so we were seeing them use drones at the very beginning to 
do monitor people and look at people's uh, body temperature and, and heat signature. Now we're seeing them also utilize it on the ground where they're attaching it on the ground. So I think the airport purchased a few uh, thermal sensors from us where they're using it on the ground. It, it's terrestrial, so they put it on a car. And as the people are coming in and out of the airport, they're uh, scanning uh, people's body uh, temperature. And all of them are, are utilizing this isotherm technology, trying to see where everyone's body temperature and body heat is at. So uh, they can confront people and say, hey, you need to quarantine yourself to prevent the spread of this disease. Wow. Yeah, we're seeing this develop pretty pretty quickly with all these these new technologies being deployed. You see videos in China and all across the world where they use these like little handheld things that they stick to their forehead. Is that what they're using too? Like, is it the uh, same yeah, it's technology? Similar, this, it's similar technology, but what this is looking for is looking for the thermal temperature. So this is a uh, it's it's a non-active sensor, so you don't have to physically touch the person to be able to scan them. You're just reading their temperature from afar. So it's not a it's not a system. It's fairly passive system, so it doesn't have to make contact with the individual. Typically, some of the new ones they put it against the person's forehead and then they scan. So this is the same concept, but it's doing it without physically touching the person. Is that deployed in, in other places in the world already? Uh, right when I was leaving Cuba, I saw a bunch of uh, terminals set up, which was cameras looking at the people coming into the country, and there was two cameras looking at the crowd of people leaving into the gates. When I was there, I knew that there was the the outbreak happening, but I didn't know how severe it was because Cuba, there's not a lot of information. There's not a lot of news and whatnot going out. So I, I didn't really know how severe it was when I was there. You know, I, I spoke to my parents. Yeah. They told a few things. But when I got to the airport, then I started realizing how severe it is when they're actually using thermal cameras to monitor people. Typically, I, I, I go to Cuba at least six times a year and I'd never seen that setup there. So it was the first time I'd ever seen that setup in the airport. So that was wow. kind of a trick my head going like, wow, this is becoming serious. Yeah, um, no doubt. No so, doubt. Yeah. You're in a pretty dense area up there in the GTA. Do you know anyone or ha do you know somebody that knows somebody with COVID-19? Absolutely no one. I actually even did an outreach on my social media saying, hey, who are my friends that have been affected? Not a single person I knew has been affected. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen anyone in terms of neighbors. Like my, my family are, is very close with the neighbors. I'm so am I. None of them likely have had it. The only person I know is a friend of mine. Their godmother got it. And then they were in the hospital for a few days. They weren't feeling well. It was something they were they were saying that they felt like there was something in their throat for a few days and then afterward their lungs started hurting. But they got over it. They got they took some uh medication that the hospital gave them. Uh, and then the, within two days they were they were good and then they just went on self-isolation for another 14 days and apparently now now she's doing very well uh, oh, there's wow. no problem it seems like some people it hits them really hard and and it goes into the lungs and it causes some sort of water that gets formed in the lungs i'm not you know i'm not i don't have any medical background but it's just from what i've read and that's causing people to you know their lungs to not function the way it should but there's some other people that are getting it but they're getting they, they're healing fairly quick they, it just goes away after a certain time it's like getting like a like a flu and then it's kind of gone after. Well, that's great that she recovered from that. I, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of warning signs out there right now telling young people are not immune. You're seeing more deaths, I guess, from, from younger people. I'm not sure. The thing is, there's not a lot of personal information given out for every single case. So sometimes it's hard to judge if cases are anomalies. You know, I'm down here in Niagara region. I, I saw online there was over 5,000 waiting to be tested in Niagara. I know there's a lot of snowbirds that Oh, wow. Return. There, there's a lot of snowbirds down here coming back from Florida. Some people are pissed off on Twitter because not all have been self-isolating. But I, I don't know. It, it's going to be interesting how much they're going to corrode us into doing the best for everybody, I guess, and isolating. And you're seeing things escalating uh, in New York and New Jersey. And you just imagine it's probably going to trickle this way eventually. Yeah, um, for sure. I, I know that they, they sent out that alert yesterday on everyone's phone saying, if, hey, if you just returned. I'm not sure if you saw that, but it was an yeah. alert that they were saying hey you gotta isolate yourself they're telling everyone to isolate themselves that just returned some people are listening to it some people are not but I, I honestly just hope that this weans off sooner rather than later and uh, we see a decline in cases but you know for me it's a first I don't even know where it's gonna go but just trying to do my part and provide yeah, equipment at the same time try to stay indoor myself yeah good man stay safe I think I met you in like 2012 I think it was something like that uh, yeah, I mean I, that's it, at the, the IT company we were working at yeah yeah, yeah, we we're both selling IT, uh, <laughs> yeah. and now you seem to be running a pretty big size drone operation. So, when did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? Back in uh, 2012, 2010, 2012, I started as a hobby.
hobby making drones and it was just something i did for fun back then the technology wasn't that great there wasn't as much lighter circuitry there wasn't as much uh, great as battery technology as we have right now like right now we have a technology called graphene which allows there to be longer duration so there wasn't all these nice stuff on the market i was just building it for fun i would get like five to ten minutes flight time i'm i'm a thrill seeker i like bungee jumping i, I like skydiving so for me being able to be inside of a drone so wear goggles uh, we call it fpv first person view wear goggles and have a camera on the drone and fly around i really thought of that very thrilling and then at around 2013, a buddy of mine that worked in the film industry came by and said, hey, I'm looking to grab this thing. It's called a gimbal. At the time, I didn't know what a gimbal was. So I started doing some research and found the technology between gimbals and drones are very similar. So what I ended up doing is I told them to put a small investment of uh, $1,200. I would build him a gimbal and then he could use it on his projects. Back then, gimbals ranged anywhere between five to $25,000. So they weren't the cheapest. Now we're seeing gimbals on the market and less than six hundred dollars you can pick yourself something decent but back then it wasn't uh, that popular and technology wasn't that great back then so what a gimbal is it's a three axis stabilizer so imagine a t uh, at the base of the t you have where the camera sits and then if you were to move the handle which we would consider the top of the t the camera would stay stationary it wouldn't move and those are based on two gyroscopes and three motors so as you move the handle the camera would stay stationary the purpose of that was so you can run after someone with a camera but not have the jitteriness or the kind of the the up and down uh, shaking movement you can go up and up and down stairs you can do a chasing scene as an example put it on a car you can put the gimbal on a car and then have the car drive you know 100 kilometers an hour chasing another car to do a chasing scene and the camera would be dead dead still and so the, all the impact movement shaking is absorbed by those three motors and those three motors work in the x y and z coordinates so they're they're all working in tandem to counteract the the external movement and the purpose of it is to keep the camera stationary at all times. Now, have these dropped in price at all for the consumers? Oh yeah, tremendously. Like going back in back in 2013, a cheap one was like around five thousand dollars. Did it wasn't that great. Now we we can find one on the market for four hundred ninety nine dollars for five hundred dollars. So they've uh, since then in the past seven years they've tremendously dropped in price. And that's mostly because they were the technology has shrunk. Um, so circuitry has become smaller. Battery technology became better and then now there's a lot of people they were able to bring this to people's homes so now you have people that use it for their cell phones they're using it you know to put their cell phone on there and it balances and they can record stuff with their families or just make home videos and home movies all the amateur guys are getting into it so now there's volume so because of vo there's volume the price has gone down significantly uh, and also technology has become much cheaper as well uh, back in the day we used to get like a gps module that was like half the size of my hand now we can get a gps module module the size of the nail on my thumb so um, things have gone smaller uh, they've become cheaper and that's kind of what led to the price dropping over the years what do you consider yourself are you like co-founder or, or ceo like what is your do you have a business card that says your title on it yeah yeah so I, i'm the director of technology so back in 2015 so between 2013 to 2015 i just built gimbals and repaired gimbals so I, I found a little void in the market where people had gimbals that were really expensive but they had no one to fix it so i was taking these in and repairing them and then basically building my own as well for people that wanted to make it so i made four different iterations of my gimbal i call them the v the v series so there was the v1 the v2 the v3 and the v4 and then after the v4 came out i was uh, not no longer able to again, compete with with these kind of people because there was a lot of competition there was no way for me to be able to bring the cost this low and be able to do you know compete with i guess chinese manufacturing you can call it <laughs> right right <laughs> when you were working on them did you have to did people just put their faith in you or did you have some sort of certification at the time or no i had zero certification so i've been building stuff since i was a kid I've, since i was a child i used to take things apart and just build them i used to build little tiny projects i love robotics i remember um, you I, building stuff like when i sat beside you at work you would build shit <laughs> with like paper yeah. clips magnets and it would run yeah yeah so I, we, we used to have i forgot what they were called the little gifts that we got from from the different vendors that would come over i take all the different gifts that they gave us apart i take all of them apart take the components and then build something so i, I remember when i was 
sitting at the desk back then, someone would always say, hey, what? why is something burning? Because I always had a little glue gun <laughs> on my desk. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. I was on the calls. I was constantly <laughs> holding stuff at the office. Was... Holy shit. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like you had a lot going on uh, <laughs> just in your little cubicle there. So what would you say the, the coolest or most fun project you, you've worked on since you've started Omnitech? One of the coolest projects I would say I've worked on is uh, being able to deliver pizza for a project. They were, they were trying to showcase the future of drones and they they had us build a a drone that could fit uh, four extra large pizzas and so what we did is we started it out about 500 meters because legally in Canada we can only go uh, visual line of sight which is considered 500 meters um, so we did a shoot about what the future of the drones going to be and uh, we were hired my company Omniview Tech was hired to go out there and build a drone that could fit the four pizzas, but also keep them warm. And, and this this is uh, November, so it wasn't <laughs> that warm out there. It was kind of cold trying to pull this off. And they wanted to take the pizza out and the cheese still be stringy. That was a very tough challenge. Oh, um, man. It, it was a fun challenge because in order to test it out we asked this company they're a big company i'm for i can't say their name they came out and and they gave us pizza so they gave us a lot of pizza this was an internal project that they were doing for themselves to basically trigger the higher ups in the company to think outside the box like drone delivery was going to be one of them they had trucks that they had converted into on the road pizza makers where they would just kind of give pizza out to people so this was one of their initiative to do something outside the box and push the limit uh, legally in canada we can't deliver anything via drone but this was more of a marketing stunt that they wanted to do yeah uh, yeah it was a lot of fun you're obviously the guy to ask this are drones the future of delivery oh 100 percent. yes you have a lot of redundancy built into them uh, also because they're capable of being connected to some sort of a network we're able to control multiple of them know where they are and where they're going at a given time right now autonomous droning is happening all the time a lot of service providers are making 3d maps they're doing land surveying they're doing lidar data analysis and they're doing all that using drones but they're doing the doing it autonomously so there's a software that's actually controlling the drone telling it when to trigger the the sensor and geotag it and and tell the drone which pattern to fly as it's collecting the the data so it, i totally see drones as being the future of delivery but even more so beyond that i think it's going to be used in a lot of different industries to be able to make it more efficient so it's a tool it's nothing that's going to replace someone at the end of the day human interaction is required a human is required to operate the drone and then afterwards take that data compile it and, and turn it into something that's usable so it, it's not it's a lot of people are thinking that okay drones are going to come and then there's going to be a lot of people not working no that's not the case it's going to create more jobs it's going to create more uh, requirements. It's, it's more of a tool than rather replacing someone. I'm just thinking with the amount of Amazon ordering that happens and how many drones they'll have to have in the sky, they'll have to be some sort of further airspace control. How regulated is that now in terms of y using your drone? So right now it's fairly regulated. In order to fly a drone, I'll walk you through the process. Um, so before you even purchase a drone, you're supposed to do your uh, ground school and obtain a license. And you get that license by the 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 laws and then going on to transport canada's website you pay ten dollars and then you do an exam once you do the exam you do a in-person exam at accredited school they basically write saying that you know how to operate then you can purchase a drone and every time you fly you have to go into nav canada's portal that they've created and you got to register every flight now these flights are only for people who are doing it for work if you're doing it as a consumer all you have to do is fly within a class g airspace and we do have some class g airspace none downtown toronto it's fairly congested so not nothing around there but you know your your neck of the woods um you know up north toronto uh, northern toronto or northern ontario there's a lot of areas that are class g airspace and you're able to fly there you still have to obey some rules which is you can't fly over crowds you're not allowed to fly over buildings and roads but let's say an open field feel free to fly there that's that's not a problem when it comes to the business side of things, you have to have your licenses, you have to have insurance, and then you have to basically report every time you're flying. And in some cases, if you're close to an airport, you do have to get a NOTAM, which is a notice to all airmen, which is letting them know that, hey, for this specific time, I'm going to own this airspace to do my work, and then I won't need it anymore. 
So you can uh, issue a no time to let other pilots know that there's some work happening there or you will be there. Is there a lot of enforcement that goes along along with this? Because I mean, like I see people with drones sometimes and I'm thinking, you know, is this person allowed to just be flying here right now over these people, you know, recording these people in a public space like this? Like, do you find uh, cops, do they give out fines or, or how does that really, how does that work? Yeah, they are giving fines. The only tough part is having to catch the person at the in the act while holding the remote and the drone being in the air so you got to first identify that individual um so what really what's um implementing these rules are people right now it's not physical cops that know where a drone is and then they're kind of saying hey don't do it here's a ticket it's mostly people that call in saying hey so and so is flying they're not flying legally or they're not flying uh responsibly responsible flying is one of the main things that transport canada puts out there make sure that everyone is flying responsibly doesn't fly over crowds don't fly over people they're trying to limit uh, eliminate any sort of issues that may happen uh, while utilizing drones they, these te this technology the drone technology wasn't that great before now it's really great they don't cause any issues they don't go down uh they, they they're built very well but you always do have the scenario where a pilot could you know hit it into a power line and then it could fall onto someone they're trying to avoid things like that from happening but the unit themselves they're very safe. They have a lot of safety features. A lot of the new units even have three 360 obstacle avoidance, which uh, some of them have up to 11 or 12 cameras that's just monitoring what's happening around it to make sure that it doesn't come into contact with anything or it doesn't hit anything. Does it take a long time to master one of these things? Not at all. It is super, super easy to fly. The reason why is they all have a GPS on board. Uh, the GPS keeps the unit in one place. So if you don't touch the sticks on the remote, the aircraft will stay in one place and it will not budge it will not move even if it's like a windy day it'll still stay in one place because of the gps that's on board and there's a lot of sensors inside that's going to be telling them hey there's a lot of high wind velocity detected it, it's recommending you to land so there comes with a lot of ai built in as well to aid the pilot in case there is issues or a low battery as an example as soon as the battery hits 30 percent, it gives you a warning at 15 percent, it doesn't give you an option it's coming back home and it's landing so it, it, there's a lot of safety features built in, in that way and also from an airport standpoint they've locked out uh, five nautical miles from the center of every single airport so as an example for us yyz toronto pearson international airport uh, no drone within five miles of it can fly the only way that you can fly is to get paperwork from nav canada submit that to the manufacturer which is dji and then they send you an unlock code and then you can unlock it for that duration of time that you need it to do up to do your work so there's like some um let's say you're, you're trying to scan a building that's close to the airport for inspection or you you want to even do work on the tarmac you want to see what issues there are there are drones right now that are scanning airplanes to find any defects or issues you know problems with the rivets and whatnot before the aircraft goes back out so it's part of their maintenance how you can fly it is by getting one of those permits from nav canada submitting it to the manufacturer and then you're you're clear to fly there dji is the big manufacturer are there any other other big ones that you, you would need to apply to or do they rule the space pretty much dji right now owns 80 percent of the world's market when it comes to drones on the consumer side and on the enterprise side which is the the business side of things be the b2b side there are a few smaller players but dji is really the big leader in in the space right now the one thing that's uh, very interesting with the canadian market is that there are only a select number of aircrafts that you can actually fly in canada legally for work that list is on the transport canada website so there's a list of aircrafts that have been approved to be able to uh, they're basically airworthy the manufacturer took the time to submit all the necessary paperwork to Transport Canada and they've been approved to to fly in Canadian airspace. Some other parts of the world don't have those kind of stringent laws, but in Canada we do. Are there any major misconceptions you see out there about drones or, or the regulations around drones? A lot of people think that, you know, privacy, that's one thing. So a lot of people don't like drones because of privacy. There's no drone that's consumer grade that has the ability to zoom um, or gives you the zooming capability. Typically once you're about 30 feet off of the ground you can't see anything that's on the ground and being close these drones are like they sound like a shop vac so it's not something that a lot of people are worried that drones cause a lot of breach of privacy that's never really the case the the big problem with drones is realistically having the correct operator behind it so that they don't fly it and hit someone with it that's really a big problem but people think of it the other way around they're like you know drones should be not around because it's gonna you know spy on me but 
you would know that dr drone is coming five minutes before it even gets to you. It is super loud. And at the same time, the cameras are not that great to be able to zoom in. They're designed that way to not allow uh, people to like do things like that. Well, that's good to know. Uh, what's the price point difference be between the consumer grade and then the enterprise? Like wh what point does it change over? A consumer unit typically starts at around $500 and works its way up all the way to about you know four or $5,000. That's for like the prosumer grade and then when it switches over to the enterprise side the cheapest one that you'd find is around five thousand uh, dollars and it works its way up to a few hundred thousand dollars so it depends what you want to do there are some units out there with uh, as an example a drone with a laser sensor attached to it those are well over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars there's some others that do scanning those ones around ninety thousand dollars so it really depends what you want to do with them mm -hmm. uh, and what kind of sensor is attached to it the aircraft itself usually is not the most expensive part it's typically the sensor that's attached to it. There's different kinds I see all over your website. What would you recommend for somebody as like a hobbyist, consumer level? Uh, you know, maybe wanted to make to make some videos or do some vacation filming. Do you have anything on your yeah, market that's so, tailored yeah, for that? Yeah, for sure. So Canadian law, actually, North the world, Europe, in uh, North America, some parts of Latin America, that an aircraft that's under 250 grams, you can fly without having any sort of license. 250 grams in here basically in the places that i've specified and then in japan they have a rule that's 180 grams so there is a um, an aircraft that is on the market called the mavic mini it's made by the manufacturer dji the mavic mini was designed to be 249 gram and then they have a japanese edition which is exactly 179 grams so dji went one gram below the requirement the reason why is they left an extra space for an sd card because the sd card would be you know a few few milligrams there so yeah yeah, yeah. that they well stay with below the the requirement and i i really vouch for that unit i love that unit it's small uh but it has all the features that the the consumer grade stuff has so it has the gps it has the vision positioning system which is a camera that looks at the ground so that it keeps it stationary when it's landing on takeoff or even flying indoors it has editing software it is a very great tool it can record 4k uh, imagery uh, it's a 12 megapixel camera and it's a three axis gimbal camera on there as well uh, so it is a great great unit it's great for beginners and for people that want to travel and they're they're worried about the laws of places that they travel this is a great companion to put in your camera gear in your camera bag and uh, it's very small and compact as well so it's easy to carry around can you see the laws around the consumer grade weight changing or is that pretty written in stone i don't think it's going to change what they're going to do they want to have a way of enforcing it so people don't do anything bad right now there is a big problem where people are using drones to go over prisons and you know put drone deliver bad things into into prisons dji is trying to uh, basically work around that using their no fly zone technology to prevent people from flying there but also they are coming out implementing which uh, another technology which allows people to download an app and see what drones are flying in their vicinity and if a drone is flying and hasn't been registered that person will know and they can infor uh, inform law officers and let them know that hey there's a person that's flying an aircraft that's not supposed to be flying it or they're flying it unsafe. So, that technology is called uh, remote ID. It hasn't hit the market yet, but that's something that they're looking into to be able to remotely ID which aircraft is flying where. So anybody with, anybody can download this app you're saying or you have to be, you have to have like, No, uh, no, not at all. Anyone can download it and you can okay. see who's flying where and and um, you can also take a look at that person person's information in terms of are they registered? Um, you, don't, you don't see any information info in terms of who that person is or whatnot just that specific flight is it registered in that area and wow. if it's a flight that's consumer you would have you can check to see is the aircraft under the requirement or is the aircraft in an airspace that it's supposed to be it's really tough to police something that that you know the pilot could be somewhere else the aircraft could be somewhere else so all that needs to come together and, and it's really tough for an officer to be able to be at the right place at the right time so they're trying to build software to to a 
create that and be able to help people drone responsibly. So it looks like it'll be it'll be very tightly regulated in the future as this develops, I'm sure, and, and yeah. more businesses adopt the technology. Do you have any recent or uh, any upcoming projects or promotions people can look for, look out for in the future? Yeah, we are doing promotions starting uh, next Monday, so that will be April the sixth onwards. That week, we're doing uh, a few shows, so definitely follow us. We are on Instagram Omniview underscore Tech, and we're basically doing live broadcastings of a few model drones, which is going to be the the Mavic Pro, the Mavic Two Pro, the Mavic Two Zoom, and the Mavic Mini, and also some cameras as well, which is the Osmo Action and the Osmo Pocket. So we're going to do live broadcasting of the their features, how they work. We're expected to have over 500 people join on this on this broadcast. And what we're planning on doing is just show how the, the design of the unit is, how it operates, and basically give uh, a discount to anyone that joins as well. So f- we're going to basically give uh, codes for people to be able to use on our website for, for all those models. Okay, great. And where did you say we can uh, catch the broadcast? It's going to be both on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. So Instagram Live, Facebook Live, and uh, YouTube Live. And you can basically Omniview underscore tech for uh, pretty much all three of them. So if you just go on either one of those platforms and type in at Omniview underscore tech, uh, you'll be able to see us. You can also follow us on right on our website. There's a little email link at the very bottom. You can just put your email in there, press subscribe, subscribe to us subscribe to our website and whenever the event does happen we would send everyone a notification that the event's happening with a link so you guys can view it that's awesome man i'll, I'll definitely post uh, all the links in the show notes now because i i do focus on bitcoin and crypto i do like to ask you before you leave what, what's your thoughts on bitcoin I, you don't have to be an expert it just could be a simple uh, opinion on, on what you've heard and what you're taking yeah so i haven't taken enough time to dive deep into it one thing that i can say for sure it's definitely the currency of the future it's something that is going to be utilized very much in the future in some form or another whether it's specifically a bitcoin itself or it'll be a different currency but it'll still be a digital currency similar to 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 bitcoin uh, and the other cryptocurrencies i haven't done enough uh, a deep dive into it which i would love to when i have some time to get to l- learn it understand it and also be able to use it myself and and, and invest in it myself but i do definitely think it, it's a currency of the future it it's going to be paving the, the way for a lot of different organizations to basically move over to the digital realm when it comes to uh, currencies. Wow, man. Well, th- well, that's a pretty big statement. You know where I stand. I'm definitely all in on <laughs> Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. I, I definitely agree with you that it is the future. Thanks, Pedro, for coming on to my podcast. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it was a blast. I love, I love talking to you. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Pedram, and thank you all for listening to episode 21 of The Having Report.